where we have the earliest record of, of art being used for healing goes back about 35,000 years to the Paleolithic caves in Spain and, and, and France and so forth. And they, they were very, by and large, very inaccessible. Some of these caves had a superficial uh, uh, sort of entry place that you could go just as you entered. And that's where I think that the people who were desperately ill were, were seen. But the others had to travel sometimes over a mile through all sorts of dark passageways, through water, uh, jagged rocks, to get to these caves. And in these caves, the medicine men of the day, that was, their, that was medicine of the day, there they were um, having painted uh, these uh, depictions of what they thought it, it would be most healing for the people who came. And there was also singing, there was also dancing, other act of course we have no record of that, but the paintings uh, are, are still there, 35,000 years. They're our oldest art. It's, it's, it's still there. So uh, one of the ways in which I meditate is that I imagine that we all have this cave. You have this cave. Okay. You know where it is? Inside. Inside your head, exactly. So there's a cave inside your head in which I go into every day in a more formal meditation and then every time before I do any painting. I go into this cave and I imagine, as it were, that I am this uh, medicine man of the time and I am creating these paintings on my wall here, which I put out there as a, as a, as a hopefully as a healing modality for people who want to be helped that way. If they don't want to be helped that way, that's a very different thing. If they want to be, it can be. The ultimate aim, well in the future, well, well in the future, maybe in a thousand years, is that whatever diseases we have then, and we'll still have diseases, but whatever diseases we have, we'll be able to be, as it were, instantly cured with this note of music, with this little painting, whatever it may be. Uh, it'll, that's what we're looking for. Every time I paint, I'm thinking, this is to help somebody get closer to being healed. Not as such to treat the illness. A lot of medicine can do that, but they can be healed and at last become a, a whole person. Mm -hmm. So that's what is in my cave, which I try to put out there in this gallery, in this cave here, uh, hopefully to have some of that effect. What kind of medicine do you uh, practice? This. <laughs> No, I, I was, I've been in medicine now for over 50 years. It was, um, it was initially psychiatry of a very unorthodox type. There's been alternative medicine, uh, nutrition, body healing, uh, many, many, applied kinesiology, many, many modalities. But, but increasingly, over many years now, in, in my creativity and encouraging the creativity of those that come to, to see me. Because what they do is more important than what I do. Do you teach this to students? Yes. Yeah, everyone, everyone who, who comes to me, we, we do art, we do photography, we do uh, uh, music, dance, poetry, whatever left out, writing, whatever it may be. All of, because it's all, it's all just creativity. How you ex express it is a different thing. I'm, I've written thousands of songs, I mean infinite poems, millions of words, uh, goodness, it, it's photography, so forth, it's, it's, it's just a particular modality and you have to, and you should be bringing that modality, that, that intention to all the, all the modalities. The Chinese uh, use, use a word which we say in English, gen, they call it run, which was uh, first used by Confucius, which they use the word as humanity, uh, benevolence, uh, love, inner perfection, whatever word you like. And we all have that. The, the trouble is we don't know it. 
and they say the greatest difficulty we have, they have another word called li, which is how much of this gen that you're able to release into the world. Along came the, the Japanese later, Dogen for example, said the purpose of meditation is to go inside and find our inner self, our gen, benevolence, Buddha nature, whatever the word may be. But I think it's very, that's very difficult to do and very self-centered because you, you're looking, you're doing, this is something I'm doing for myself. It's, uh, which is called in, in Japanese jur juriki, self-power, I am doing this. It's far better if you can take a painting, preferably take a person, especially take a patient and see what's inside them. See their gen, see their soul, and therefore you find your own in everybody else's. Okay. And hopefully, this hopefully, as best as I can, that's what these are trying to do as best as I can do it at the moment. Wonderful. So it's, it's gen to gen with as little negatively as possible. <laughs> and as I was saying before, this Back in 1960, I started working in a, the backwards of a chronic mental hospital. The backwards. Many of those patients had been there. I had 200 to 400 patients, and plus acute patients. And many of them had been there for 20, 30, 40 years. They still used to dress up in the morning and go to the dairy to milk the cows. But there hadn't been any cows there and there was no dairy. It's all long gone. And most of them were in an in a, in a, uh, enclosed airing court. They just spent all day on this concrete, uh, many of them eating their own feces, God knows what, and nothing was done for them. Mm -hmm. And the average doctor who was looking after other patients like that, I had the, actually the worst, but the, they would be there for half an hour and they'd run home. And I loved it because what was so beautiful about these, these so-called, uh, you know, whatever you want to use, you want a word you want to use, was that their soul, their gen, was so obvious. There was no ego nonsense getting between the vision of the inner self. Yes. And, and, that, and the same thing, uh, I love to tell a story about my mother with Alzheimer's. Everyone says Alzheimer's, it, it, these people are, are, are dead. Like, my mother was at least 12 years in Alzheimer's. And at her funeral, people were talking about her as if she had died 12 years beforehand. Oh, that's too bad. And, and, and I, believe, I believe that she knew everything that happened to her in, that, in her own way in that time. Now, what was fascinating, we'd come over to Australia to see her twice a year, and she hadn't talked or done, I mean, she, she didn't talk, she couldn't feed herself, couldn't look after herself in any way. But, but we would have her singing, dancing, talking. Susan, my wife, would have her, have her dancing and she'd say, what do you think of dancing, Doris? She hadn't spoken in six months and she'd say, it's marvellous. And, and one time, I tell the story about Susan, we were, it was the middle of summer, we were there in sandals. And the only person who had bigger bunions than my wife was my mother. <laughs> and we're there with bare feet, and my mother is taking, we were engaged at the time, not married, my mother's taking Susan's bunions and her bunions and bringing them together. <laughs> and that I thought, thought, and holding my hand, well, that's the time for us to get married. Oh, right. But, but when, when she was, uh, six months before she died, again, she hadn't spoken for six months, uh, we visited her and I took her my little grandson, who was a baby. She immediately takes the baby and not having spoken for six months said, little darling, and she's stroking the head and this goes on for hours, little darling, little darling, we couldn't take the baby away from her. See, she was just pure gen, pure soul, no ego nonsense. And then we had to leave and I gave her a doll. And when she died, six months later, the doll was beside her bed and she stroked all the hair off.
Well, that was a nice gift, though. It gave her somebody to love, you know? Yeah, but, but that's, what, that's what's in everybody. Every patient, every person has that. That's, that's, and that's what I'm trying to hope that you can relate to somewhat uh, with this.